this age. And I mean, why did you write this book? Let's start right there. I mean, yeah. let's just start okay. right there. Why did you write this book? Right. Yeah. So it's not a book that could have been written at any point or any time in the 2000 year history of Christian faith. I mean, we do live in a particular time. And one of the things that's very difficult is for you to understand your own epoch because it's the only time in which you've lived. So it helps to try to gain some historical perspective. And that's what I do a little bit maybe in the first part of the book that we have entered now fully, we've fully arrived into a secular age. And I'm using the word secular, not in the context of wrongheaded culture war conflicts. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a philosophical position where God at best is moved to the very periphery of society. Uh, Nietzsche, as much as anyone, foresaw the coming of this age. He was something of a herald of it. He was a bit of ahead of his time, but he knew that that time would come, and it's fully arrived. And so uh, we live at a time when there is a particular, and as far as historical perspective is concerned, a unique challenge to maintaining any kind of religious faith, uh, but I'm speaking in the context of Christian faith. And so that's the time in which we live. And the phenomenon of people losing their faith, in one sense, should not be surprising. It Again, it was anticipated by Nietzsche, and he was correct in that perspective. And some people kind of react to it out of, you know, frustration with anger, but that's That's unhelpful. I mean, being angry at modern people for losing their faith is sort of like being angry at medieval people for dying of the plague. I mean, something has happened in our own time that has made the sustain of Christian faith not necessarily automatic. And so that's that's what lurks in the background of the writing of the book. Wow. Yeah, and that's so good. And I mean, the quote you just said, it was in page 14, because I had it right here. And I'm like, I want to talk about this, where you said uh, being angry with modern people for losing their faith is like being angry with medieval people for dying of the plague. I mean, that it that right there is just so profound because uh, it tells us about, like you said, the epoch that we're in. Uh, but also, like, I wonder, is this so this is nothing new? Would you say that? Would you say or would you well, say it's, this? It's not it's not new you know, over the last century or so, it is new within this. I mean, secularism is something that is newly arrived in Western society. If you're speaking from a historical, you know, position, for example, for example, let me just work on this a minute. So the book, I actually introduced the book by talking about my wife and I walking for the third time, the Camino de Santiago. Now, the Camino de Santiago is a medieval pilgrimage. The most famous route begins in saint jean pied de Port, france crosses the Pyrenees, and 500 miles later, you arrive in Santiago de Compostela, Spain. And I won't go into all the reasons about why we walk it, other than to say it's, it's very good and healing for our souls. But walking a thousand-year-old pilgrim route is a little bit like a time machine. Mm. You can feel an earlier epoch, and you can kind of become aware that there was a time when the wider society assisted us in maintaining Christian faith. Now, I don't have any overly romantic notions about the medieval period. It came with its own challenges and problems and shortcomings and all of that. I get that. Um, but there is something different about that time and our time. And I was very aware of that. And when you're walking Beto for 500 miles, in our case, it takes us about 40 days to do that. And that's all you're doing. Your life is reduced to the blessed simplicity of carrying on your back, everything you need and just walking 12 to 15 miles a day westward. You have a lot of time to think to meditate, to contemplate. And I was thinking about the phenomenon of people losing faith, people that had grown up in Christian faith, at some time had professed Christian faith, and somehow it vanishes, it withers, it disappears from their life. 
And I thought, well, if I could walk with these, if, if they could walk with me, if we could walk together on this Camino de Santiago for a day or two, what might our conversation be like? What might we talk about? And I'd been thinking about this for 200 miles, two weeks. And we had arrived at the lovely little hilltop village of Castro Haris uh, after our long walk for that day. And I sat outside where we were staying and I just, I picked up the little notebook I was carrying with me and I wrote at the top of it, when everything's on fire, I'm not entirely sure where that inspiration came from, but it just, I just felt that way. You know, what can we do when everything's on fire? And I wrote that. And then I, then I jotted down about 11 conversations that I would like to have that turns out to be the 11 chapters of the book. And so, so th- that was, that was October of 2019. So like two and a half years ago, a little less. So that's when the book was conceived, October 2019. I didn't really start writing it, though, until January of 2020. And I'd already given it the title, When Everything's on Fire, and then, and then everything was on fire. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's where the book comes from. And that's, that's kind of, that's, that's what I, that's the thought process. And that's what I, I'm feeling like. I, I, the last thing I want to, the absolute last thing I want to do is try to reprimand or scold or shame anyone who's just, their faith is hanging by a thread. There's nothing in the book. I think, you know, you've read it, Beto, you know, there's nothing in the book that's me trying to scold or shame or tell somebody just, you know, straighten up, buddy. <laughs> there's nothing like that. Rather, I'm trying to have a tender conversation with those that might just have still the modicum of wanting to hold on to their faith, but they're not sure how to do it. I want to try to help that person. Yeah, that's so good. And I mean, you talk about uh, some ideas that are super relevant right now. And I mean, I love, uh, first of all, I love, I love the Camino de Santiago journey. That's amazing in itself. The stories that you share about uh, later on going to, I think this is in a different occasion, but when you go to, I, I think it's called the day Derrida died. Uh, yes, when you definitely. go to France and meet this person, but also, uh, what's the other one? Oh, deconstruction. And you have a, one of your your chapters is called Deconstructing Deconstruction. And yeah. I feel like like a lot of people can identify with this with these ideas right now, especially, you know, like we're here in America, we're in California, well, I'm in California, but um, I always say that a lot of what happens culturally in the U.S., it kind of replicates in the world, and still a lot of people around the world look to to people from America or in America because, you know, there's, there's books, there's ideas, there's things like that, and uh, a part of me feels like a little bit afraid that man is this what we're spreading are we spreading right now like almost like hopelessness of deconstruction and people losing their faith is that what we know the christian church in america is portraying to the world yeah i i don't know that i mean maybe but i i think it's inevitable i think mm. that look what 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 the american church is facing presently now almost at a critical level that is where to use the the phrase that is so in vogue today, many Christians are experiencing deconstruction of faith, perhaps to the most severe extent that it's lost altogether, has already a generation or two earlier been experienced in Western Europe. Mm. And eventually that eventually I would say the church in the entire Western world is going to have to pass through those fires. You know, whether it's a generation or two yet to come. I think it's simply inevitable. It's why I spend a little bit of time early on in the book talking about Frederick Nietzsche and what he described as the death of God, what he meant and didn't mean by that. Because I think it was, I think of Nietzsche as sort of a mad prophet. I mean, obviously, in the end, I don't agree with him. But I have deep respect for him and even a kind of affection for, for Frederick Nietzsche. I've read wow. a lot of what he says. I agree with a lot of what he says. I disagree with his ultimate conclusions and his uh, proposed solution to the problem. But mm-hmm. I, I don't think there, I don't think there's any avoiding it. I think, you know, it may arrive in certain places in the world later and other places earlier, but I think we are far enough into the progress of modernity that eventually every Christian community is going to have to pass through these fires. 
Wow. I mean, that <sighs> so profound. I almost wish we had, because, uh, you know, I love like the history when you talk about Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, you talk about them as, well, there's this phrase like the masters of suspicion. And yeah. I have, I have this emoji reaction that I, you know, I kind of tend, I already labeled belief into five emojis, you know? So it goes from like the farthest away, which is blasphemous to divine, which is, you know, obeying Jesus, right? Being Jesus like, um, mm -hmm. but one of my emojis is skeptical and I feel like masters of suspicion totally describes that emoji you know it's like huh yeah <laughs> right and in a sense you know you mentioned friedrich nietzsche you mentioned karl marx and you mentioned sigmund freud as the masters of suspicion and yeah. i wonder uh i mean so interesting because i agree with you when you say like you value the work you value like you, you don't come to the same conclusion but you value the ideas the Uh, I mean, they're great thinkers and proponents, yes. right? Yes. Um, so I think in a sense, I'm utilizing these emojis, you know, the skeptical to almost like bring people to the conversation, right? To say, hey, I value that. Yeah, we don't sustain Christian faith by avoiding the hard questions. Ah. Uh, I think if... If all you're doing is, well, these are the most formidable challenges that can be brought to Christian faith. Therefore, I will simply avoid them. Mm. Uh, that's not real faith. Now, it, it doesn't mean that every believer has to, on their own, all by themselves, take on the Frederick Nietzsche's of every age. That's, that's not the, what I mean. This is a task for the entire church. And uh, we can sometimes rely on those that are more suited to engage in these kind of discussions. But avoiding the problem, as with almost everything in life, that that only makes it worse, right? It, it, it doesn't help at all. You're not going to sustain faith by pretending you aren't occasionally struggling with doubts. Wow. Uh, what I've learned is if you bring doubt out into the daylight, usually it's not nearly as monstrous as you think it is. It, actually, m most doubts that arise within the journey of Christian faith can be survived if they'll just be brought out into the open, into the light. Mm -hmm. It's when we try to lock them away in a closet of certitude and pretend they're not there, that's when they mutate into monsters that can sometimes be so powerful that we can't overcome them. Yeah, love it. I mean, we got to bring it to the open. I feel like that's been one of my goals with Christian Podcast. Because at the beginning, honestly, I thought, what a name. I mean, it doesn't mean anything like Christian Podcast, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but at the same time, I feel like this it is... It gives you a lot of room to do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, and yeah, I, I feel like I want to... I almost want to give a better name to the word Christian, you know, a, a, yeah. a name where it feels more like we're trying to listen. We're trying more to like move from certitude to, to conversation. You know, I, I, I also work with Soren Kierkegaard quite a bit in the book who, mm -hmm. in fact, even more than Nietzsche, who is sort of the very similar to Nietzsche, but arrives at the opposite conclusion. Soren Kierkegaard is a, thinker from the from the similar period of time dealing with similar issues even though they were unaware of one another uh who ultimately re ends up on the christian side of things but soren kierkegaard he's the one that said i'm paraphrasing here um when when every but when everyone is a christian no one is a christian and when everything is christian no one knows what christian means wow. i mean christian actually in one, it should presuppose a struggle. Mm. If, I mean, it's not easy to be a Christian. And it was never, in, the, the invitation of Christ to be what we call a Christian is take up your cross yeah. and follow me. That should not be understood as a walk in the park, as something that's easy, as something that just can be assumed. In fact, I think somewhere in the book, I, I write something to the effect, Uh, Christ is found by those who seek him, not those who pres presume him. Mm. And so uh, 
I, you know, I don't, I don't think we live in a Christian nation or a Christian culture. I don't think really such, such a thing exists, but those that do think that way, uh, they find themselves being tempted to be very deeply accommodated by the wider culture and thus really turning Christianity, not into the demanding call to follow Jesus that it was meant to be, but just sort of some version of being some kind of an American or something like that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, one of my, you know, the, the things I discovered as I came to the U.S. like 16 years ago is that for sure there's almost like a, a, a an idea of there's a Christian nation that you can see it in culture, right? Like I would, like, for right. example, I mean, we wouldn't have Christian radio in Mexico except right. for maybe like one or two stations, which was already like miraculous. But um, but here, I mean, there's there was or there were, I don't know if there still are because I don't listen to, to much radio, but there were a lot of like Christian stations. And when I would tune into them, which I kind of know the heart, but it felt like they try to utilize Christian and then that equated safe for the whole family almost like now this <laughs> this anybody can listen to this yeah. and i had a yeah. lot of trouble it, with it, that it becomes almost a synonym synonym for family you yeah. know like like christian is nothing more than like the disney channel for children or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i had a lot of trouble with that because i felt like th that's not the call of jesus i mean jesus said right. you know a parent is going to fight with their kid. A kid's going to fight with the parent. Uh, you follow me, you take up your cross. And yeah. I feel like that is the, uh, when I say Christian, I, I mean, let's wrestle. Let's wrestle together. Let's let's talk the ideas yeah. out. Right, right on, Beto. That's right on. That's it. All right. So one of the ideas. A struggle is presumed. A struggle is presumed. Mm. And so uh, I, I, think, I think we're in a much safer place when we are struggling to maintain and live, that's the emphasis, live Christian faith, than when we just assume that it's easy or that we can just sort of like follow Jesus by floating downstream. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. So is that a little bit of what deconstruction means? Like people who encounter a problem and almost like the parable of Jesus saying, you know, the, the, the seed lands on the soil and then if it yeah. doesn't land on good soil, then the birds come and take mm. it away, snatch it away. In a sense, is, is that what's happening with deconstruction? Uh, what's I mean, your vantage point? Uh, I use the word deconstruction in the book only because it is a term that is suddenly burst into vogue. Even, I mean, I, you know, I was writing this book, whatever, two years ago. And so, and I was using that term because it was current, but it's even more so now. Uh, I, I wasn't using it to try to be cute or clever or contemporary. I was just using it because it's, it's what I have to use. I would prefer not to. I have enough understanding of philosophy to understand where it really comes from. It comes from French philosopher Jacques Derrida and deconstruction theory that has to do with literary texts and stuff like that. I'm not going to get into all that. Uh, but for whatever reason, it became the term that people have used. I don't really like it because it 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 has too much of a violent sound to it because deconstruction can sound an awful lot like destruction. Mm. And it so rhymes. I reach for other kinds of metaphors. But what I'm talking about is the phenomenon of you, you have – you know, you begin your faith journey with Jesus wherever, maybe as a child, maybe you inherited it from your family or you picked it up somewhere along the way. And you've had a kind of faith that has been, for lack of a better word, believable, sustainable, livable. And then you run into a crisis where suddenly certain aspects are being challenged. And these, these challenges may in fact be good challenges. These see, not all doubts are bad. Some things that we find ourselves doubting, in fact, should be doubted. And I allude to this in the book where, you know, like 18 years ago in midlife, um, I began to have some doubts about some things I had more or less just assumed about God concerning his character and his nature and how God relates to sinners and things like that. 
And that, that creates a moment of uh, uncertainty and you're not comfortable and you're, you're wondering, am I drifting away from the faith once delivered? But what I discovered was if you'll remain honest and open and continue to seek God, that very often these doubts are doorways into a better way of, in fact, believing about God. So I, I, t- I use metaphors like the water that turns to wine or or in the book, I don't so much talk about that there. I think I may mention it, but I talk about how uh, maybe it's like an icon that is found somewhere, an icon of Christ that has been lost and it's neglected and it's covered with soot and grime and dirt and all of that. And it's precious because it has the image of Christ, but the image of Christ has become obscured by these contaminants. And so what do you do? Well, you have to restore and you bring in the restoration artist. And she comes and she's got her brushes and her solvents. What she doesn't have in her toolkit is a sledgehammer and dynamite. (laughs) And so if we're talking about, uh, you know, restoring, that's a word I might want to use, restoring our faith, not deconstructing, but restoring, uh, we want to understand this is very precious. Let's be careful with it. Also understand that deconstruction, even if you use that term, is not an end in itself. It has to be simply a process to a better place. You can't deconstruct forever and have anything left at the end. Uh, Another analogy I use in the book is uh, I talk about remodeling your theological house. And, you know, along we, we all pick up various ideas about how we talk about and think about God. This is our theological house, a palace in the mind for Christ the King. But at some point we may realize that parts of our house are unworthy of Christ. They're dilapidated. They're in need of renovation. And so that's when we have to go on a remodeling project. But everybody knows that remodeling the house while you live in it is very inconvenient and troublesome, but that's the way it goes. And so I tell my a little bit anyway of my own story of having to renovate or remodel my theological house while living in it. But your theological house isn't one thing. It's many things. It's, it's like a sprawling mansion of all kinds of rooms, some rooms, that is some aspects of my theology were largely untouched, pretty much left the same. Other rooms had to have a more serious remodel and some rooms, maybe the word deconstruction really is adequate. Maybe there were some rooms that I had to bring in some sledgehammers and take it right down to the foundation and begin to rebuild. But that's all, that's all acceptable as long as you understand that the foundation is the revelation given to you by God through the spirit that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Once you have that revelation, you can stand on that. And then everything else becomes negotiable. Hmm. But, but we, we stand on that. The, the, the foundation isn't everything I've ever been taught about the Bible by some preacher way back when the foundation is the spirit given revelation that Jesus is the son of God. And that's what we build on. And everything else is negotiable. Wow. Oh man. You're, my mind's like right now is it's, it's so good. Um, here's something I wrote and I feel like um, it's, it's not, it's not how I feel. It might be how I felt at some point, but it's maybe me just trying to describe a little bit of what people wrestle with when it comes to exactly what you're saying, you know, like what parts of my of my house am I going to to demolish and what parts am I going to build? So I wrote this uh, when it comes to the Bible. Sometimes you have to do mental gymnastics. It's like plain Scrabble and you can end up with different meanings and interpretations. Mm-hmm. Some could be even harmful and non helpful. I mean, how do how does that resonate uh, with I, you? I think that's right on, Beto. I mean, look, most of us should at this point be aware that you can quote prove anything you want with the Bible. I mean, you could just try it. I mean, just just tell me what what you want to believe, and I'll show you how to prove it as it were with the Bible. It just doesn't mean that it actually is consistent with Christ himself. So the Bible can be, uh, you can, you can make the Bible stand on its hind legs and dance a jig for you without (laughs) even really being aware that that's what you're doing. 
Wow. And so, because the Bible is a big book and it says a lot of things and you can just kind of find the parts you like and build from there. That's why we need some sort of way to center ourselves in scripture. And we're actually told what it is. It's Jesus himself. Mm-hmm. And so we, we allow Jesus to preside over the scriptures. I understand people can get confused about that because it is the scriptures that point us to Jesus. Amen. I'm not arguing with that, but I'm saying ultimately it's such a big and vast book that we have to find a way to center ourselves in it. And we do that by allowing Jesus to show us how to read the Bible. You know, some people say, well, you're you're cherry picking the Bible, to which I would say everybody does. Mm. Everybody does that. Allow Jesus to show you how to do it well. Some people, for whatever reason, are terrible at cherry picking the Bible. They pick all the worst parts. Let Jesus show you how to read Scripture, how to interpret Scripture, how to understand that the ultimate purpose of Scripture is to point us to Jesus. Wow. That is so good. And I feel like the, I mean, me personally, I feel like the the Bible should read me. Right? Like it should it should tell inform my heart where it's standing. And but I mean, oh man, this is so good. So let's talk about some of the some of the items of your house that you had to demolish mm. that you think could be helpful for other. Because even in the book, you mentioned. I mean, I think it was one of your friends who, right after uh, what was it, an Easter service, said, "Okay, I'm. Yeah. That was my last. I'm done." Yeah, I mean, I, I do tell that. It's a true story of a pastor here in St. Joseph, Missouri, same city I'm in, uh, a pastor of a church. It was, I don't, I think it was a Calvary Chapel church or had been, but it was a church like that. If people are familiar with what those are who on the Sunday after Easter of all things, he's the pastor, the pastor of the church gets up and announces to his congregation that he's an atheist and he's been an atheist for a year and a half. And he's decided that Christianity is all a fable and that we should just, you know, be done with it and go on and live our lives. <laughs> I, I laugh because I don't know what else to do. Uh, but as I met with him after that bombshell he drops on his church, I met with him, I think that week he came and met with me. And I, I think it was just too late really to help him. But what had happened is he had received a fundamentalist version of Christianity that he could not distinguish from historic Christianity. And within fundamentalism, which, by the way, is actually a modern creation, it's a wrongheaded reaction to the Enlightenment. Hmm. But within fundamentalism, everything is tied together so tightly that if you, for example— well, maybe, maybe I don't read Genesis as an actual scientific account of the origin of the cosmos, and I don't have to believe that the universe is 6,000 years old. I can receive the credible scientific testimony that it's 13.8 billion years old, plus or minus 0.04%, and still hold on to the spiritual truth given to me in Genesis. Well, if, if you aren't able to make that move, when it's all or nothing, when you have to believe every jot and tittle of fundamentalism or you can't believe anything, well, sometimes you end up as a pastor announcing your atheism the Sunday after Easter. And so there there are just better ways to deal with these issues. And what's interesting, Beto, is there really isn't any issue that suddenly emerged on the scene that Christians haven't been thinking about, writing about, dealing about for centuries. It's just that you may not find it in your own particular narrow little, you know, stream that you've been in or little confine. So you may need to open to the wider body of Christ and get out of your own little sectarian uh, corner and under and and avail yourself to the wisdom of the entire body of Christ, both in ecumenical width and historical length. But um, w- when we talk about deconstruction, we're almost always talking about some sort of reaction to fundamentalism. And what I've seen mm-hmm. is that sometimes people um, 
they, they lose their Christianity, but they keep their fundamentalism. <laughs> wow. How, <laughs> what does that look like? Christian, to being a fundamentalist atheist. Yeah, I would suggest let's let go of the fundamentalism and try to hold on to the treasure that is the faith. Hmm. What what does that look like? What what does a fundamentalist who's lost his Christian side of it? Uh, what does he look like when he stands on a fundamentalist atheist? It's just the same side of the same, the different side of the same fundamentalist coin. They're still living in a world without nuance, without subtlety, hmm. without listening to the wisest. They're still living in a world where they're mostly contending with straw man arguments. Uh, rather than understand, okay, this is a rich faith that has developed over 2,000 years, and let's see if we can find the best of it, not the worst of it. I mean, if, if you want to find the worst of Christianity and critique it, yeah, you can do that. That's child's play. But, you know, that's not, that's not something done in good faith. Let's try to find those that would, you know, more or less most Christians over the century would say, yeah, these are our wise sages, These are the women and men that really have exhibited the spirit of Christ and can help us to understand what it means to be a Christian. So uh, fundamentalism is, is rooted in fear, and it's reactionary, and it works both ways. And so someone gets afraid of science, which they, there's no need to be. I don't know of any scientific theory that's any threat to my Christian faith. But people get afraid of, of science or modernity or uh, just knowledge or whatever. And so they retreat and they react and, and they, they build walls and they have a fortress mentality until that all crumbles. And then suddenly they leap to the other side And now they're still now they're just a fundamentalist atheist, no, not willing to engage in the in the more nuanced and wise, credible, you know, aspects of Christian faith. They've locked themselves in another panic room, afraid that maybe there might be something true about Christianity. Mm, wow! Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, I mean, I mean, look, atheists can have doubts too. I mean, they can wake up uh -huh. in the middle of the night going. What if there is a God? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oops. Ah, oh, man, that is so good. <laughs> Which I want to hasten to add. I don't say that in any way is trying to threaten. Mm. Uh, if What if there is a, the God that I'm speaking of is, is a God of love perfectly revealed in Jesus? And when I ask, especially if it's former Christians who have become atheists, describe to me the God you don't believe in. Which, interestingly, they can do very well. And they describe to me the God they don't believe in. I virtually always can say, you know what? I don't believe in that God either. But I do believe in the God revealed in Jesus Christ. Wow. What they're, what they're usually reacting to is a God that is portrayed as ang angry, violent, and retributive. And they've been, they've been told that that's the only way the Bible presents God. I understand you can use the Bible in such a way to present God as angry, violent, and retributive, but I also know you don't have to do it that way. There is a way in Christ to understand that God is not angry, and he's not violent, and he's not retributive, and he's perfectly revealed in Jesus. Yes. Ah, man, I totally agree. I feel like that's my, my theological ground is as simple as um, Jesus is God and God is good. And yeah. believe me, like it took me several years to be able to like freely and with conviction say, th this is what I can stand on. This is the ground I can, I can say, yeah. this is it. Here's the thing, Beto. Um, we, we know that Orthodox uh, Christians, I don't mean the denomination of Orthodoxy, but just Orthodox Christians confess that Jesus is God. But the confession of the divinity of Christ is not so we can say, oh, I know what God is like. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. And God is omnipresent. God is all the omnis. And Jesus is that. No, that's backwards. We don't know what God is like. If we allow ourselves to just assume what we do, what we tend to do is project either our own fears or our own ideals into an omni level and say, that's God. 
It's actually the opposite. In confessing that Jesus is God, what we're saying is we don't know what God is like, but Mm. what we have come to believe is that Jesus is the revelation of who God is. Think about this. At the end of the Apostle John's poetic prologue to his gospel, he, the last line of that introduction, John 1, 18, it says, no one has ever seen God. The only begotten oh, yeah. son who is near the father's heart, he has made him. known." Now think about it. This is John writing in the first century, and he says, no one's ever seen God. We could argue with him. We could say, wait a minute, John. I mean, what about, what about Abraham? You know, he saw God had a meal with him under the oaks of Mamre. What about Moses? He saw God and his face was shining. He brought the 70 elders of Israel up on Mount Sinai. And it says, and they saw God and ate and drank. What about Isaiah? He saw God in the temple in the year King Uzziah died. What about Ezekiel? He had visions of God by the river Kibar. And John would say, look, you don't have to teach me the Bible. I know what it says. (laughs) But no matter what revelations, dreams, visions, theophanies, Christophanies, Theophanies that people have had throughout time compared to the revelation of the word made flesh. No one has ever seen God. So Jesus is not the where we end. We don't end with Jesus. Oh, and Jesus is that. He's God. No, we start with Jesus. We begin with Jesus, and we never deviate from this confession. Jesus is the perfect revelation of who God is. Wow. That that's so substantial right there. And I this th- that right there uh, Jesus is because I don't know if this is I mean in your book you talk about mystics uh, mm-hmm. in the Christian church right and you say that somebody has to experience God to really understand this it's not like just head knowledge it's not right. just orthodox right like I, I got the right knowledge about who this God is I believe the right beliefs it's it's about an experience also and I feel like that revelation that you just said, like Jesus is the ultimate revelation of what God can look like. I I almost feel like that's that's just God showing himself by experience to people. It's almost like I don't even know how to who mm-hmm. tell that to somebody else unless they experience it. It's almost like I can say, hey, you know, God, Jesus is the ultimate revelation but it just stays there. If they don't experience Jesus as the ultimate revelation, right. they don't get well, it. Yeah, in the book, I, I, I talk about something that Karl Rahner, um, German theologian, said in 1971. He said, the Christian of the future will be a mystic. That is someone who has experienced something, or they will cease to be anything at all. Now, that was 50 years ago. And what Carl Rahner called the future in 1971 is what we call today. The future has arrived. And I agree with Rahner. I think he was very, very prophetic. The Christian of now today is going to be a mystic. Don't let that word scare you. A mystic is someone who seeks and at some level experiences you know, encounters and achieves an experience within the mystery of God. And this is set forth in scripture as entirely normative. I mean, we've reached a point where Christian faith will not be sustained alone by allegiance to a tradition or by intellectual argument alone. Uh, It's going to be sustained by those who've had their own experience in God. Now, the part of the problem of modernity, and I, I unpack this in the book, is we've been kicked up inside our head. And we've been told that the only experience that is valid is that which can be empirically verified. I just want to just look at you and tell you, well, that's not true. And by the way, there aren't any, con- at this moment, contemporary philosophers who, lo- who believe that anymore. I mean, that's that's actually old thinking, but it's just now starting to settle within, you know, the wider society. The idea that if you can't prove, verify empirically um, something you claim, then it's invalid. That's just not true. I mean, I have again, I've already said I have no quibble, no problem 
with scientific claims. I just don't have any problem with it. They're doing their thing. I say, rock on. I don't know of any scientific theory that's a threat to my faith. The only thing I would add is once through in the empirical methods, science has said everything they can discern about the phenomenon of being. They haven't said everything because there is the phenomenon of spirit and heart. Mm. And I think most people already know this. It was Blaise Pascal who way back, you know, in the 17th century said, the heart has its reasons of which reason knows nothing. Yeah. Blaise Pascal is one of the great mathematicians in all of history. He wasn't opposed, opposed to reason and rational thought. He's considered one of the great rational thinkers of history. And yet he had his own experience with God, and he knew that the heart has its reasons, which reason knows nothing. So part of what I want to do is help people come down out of their head, into their heart, where they have the potential to actually encounter and experience God in Christ. Wow. That's that's right there. Um what a great invitation, Brian. I feel like um uh, well, first, this is what I'm going to do. Okay? We are going to go from blasphemous to divine, but first I'm going to offer an emoji reaction to your book. <laughs> when okay. everything's on fire. <laughs> All right? So, we're going to see how it goes. But this is just a reaction. It's my reaction. Maybe yeah, people will right. react differently. And I do it. I do this on purpose because I almost want these type of people to read the book. So here we go. We're going to see what happens next. We got an ex skeptical reaction let me show it to you i think you're seeing it right now do you see my skeptical emoji right there <laughs> awesome so my reaction is skeptical but now we're gonna go from blasphemous to divine all right and what that means is you're gonna tell me let me just pull this guy out of here you don't see it but I don't know what I'm doing. Here it goes. Okay, so what we're gonna do is gonna go from the the most blasphemous idea about God to the most divine. Okay, and this could be related to your book. You can say you can mention any guy you want. It's whatever you feel like. We're gonna do this. So if I ask you, what is the most blasphemous idea in a post-Christian world, secularized society, what would you say? I would say that it's the holdover from a perverse, aberrant Christian idea that God somehow appoints people for eternal torment. That somehow Ooh. God operates an eternal torture chamber just because some people didn't quite believe the right things about God or worse yet, that God just decided for his quote own glory, he wanted to torture some people forever. That is blasphemous. That blasphemous. Is blasphemous. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so good. And the funny thing is, I know some people would say that what Juju said is blasphemous. So <laughs> that, but I mean, that's a conversation for another time, and that would be fun. Uh, let's move on. Yeah. What would be the most skeptical idea when it comes to the post-Christian world? <laughs> I would just say I'm deeply skeptical of atheism. Let mm. me explain. I, I like understand... That people struggling with doubt. I understand people struggling with the, you know, how do we reconcile the claims of a good God with the with the presence of evil in the world? I understand it. I understand all kinds of doubt. I could be sympathetic to the struggles with agnosticism, but to be an atheist, to say there is no God, that just strikes me as nothing more than rank superstition. <laughs> I'm just skeptical of that. Wow. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Let's move on to inspire. What's something inspiring or inspired in this post-Christian secularized world? 
Hmm, that's a little bit harder. Um, inspired. I would say that um, I, I still, I, I still would say. I mean, I'm, I'm going to nuance it, and I'm going to maybe not mean it the way everybody else means it, or some people mean it. But I would say the, the scriptures are inspired. Hmm. You know, I've been I've been reading scriptures every day for 40 years. I, mean, I read, you know, this morning. I not to not to find something to write about or sermons, but just I just live within the scriptures, and especially when I go to the Gospels and I read about Jesus, I. I even though I know the story so well, I always find myself being inspired. Hmm. That that I want to be like that. I want I want to love this person more. I want to follow him. And so I could say to the scriptures, or maybe I would just say, let me say it this way: the gospel story of Jesus remains inspiring no matter what. Love it. Ah, that's so good. Okay. Uh let's move on to holy. Is there anything holy in the post-Christian world secularized society? Mm. Well, the word holy, uh, we get put up, we 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 end up, we kind of default towards thinking it means super good. Mm. That's not really what it means. The word actually means other, something that's other, and I, I think well, I don't know. I don't know where, where to point you to exactly, but the, but those that are daring, let's say it this way. I think I think those that aspire to, or at least some level, begin to attain a life of prayer hmm. are holy. Again, that sounds real religious the way I just said it, and it could be misunderstood. Sound like a cliche? I don't mean it that way. I mean, if you really could be more formed by prayer than by social media or cable news hmm. you would be on your way to becoming a holy person and i think that's what you should aspire to not not a goody goody not a person that's trying to shame others that's a distort that's not holiness at all that's that's being a pharisee but if if you were the kind of person who is moving in the direction of being more shaped and formed by how you engage with God in prayer than by uh, the forces that we find so prevalent in social media, and et cetera. That would be something that's holy and that we can aspire to. Wow. Love it. And finally would be divine. What is the, what is the most divine idea in the post-Christian secularized society? Well, I, I don't know that it, I'm not going to say the most. I will say here's an axiom that is the result of years and years and years of trying to grapple with Scripture and Christian faith that I think is, is, is very divine. And I'll say it like this. God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. In fact, there's never been a time when God wasn't like Jesus. We haven't always known this. But now we do. And that's a very divine idea. Wow. Okay, there you have it, my friends. We just went from blasphemous to divine with Brian Zan. Uh, Brian, where can you point people to to discover more about you know, your books, your writings, your ideas? Yeah, I'm easy to find. I mean, you just Google me. I mean, there's not, there's, I'm the only Brian Zond that I know out there, you know, Z-A-H-N-D, Brian Zond. I'm on Twitter. I'm pretty active there, a little bit Instagram, a little bit Facebook. I have a blog site, brianzond.com. You'll find the church where all my sermons are. I'm not hard. I mean, I'm on Amazon for books. I'm not hard to find. Now, if you are YouTube, you'll find sermons there. You'll also find Crank saying I'm a heretic, but I'm not. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not. Okay. So, so uh, I'm not hard to find. Awesome. Thank you, Brian, for being on the show. My privilege, Beto. Thank you.